Hello again all, Dr. JC here, part two of week eight. This is the last part of week eight. We're going to build on last week's discussion about imperialism and the causes of World War I and look specifically at what America's doing in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So let's briefly take a look at some salient events that take place in the late 1800s and early 1900s, especially from an American historical standpoint. As previously mentioned in other lectures already, the United States has, had been pretty active even during the American Civil War era, clearly trying to help open trade and markets in Asia through their contact with the Japanese and subtle support to the British and French during these opium wars. The Monroe Doctrine had tried to lock down the Western Hemisphere to European interference, and the U.S. will begin to eye possessions there. We'll talk about the Spanish-American War a little bit later in this part. And as an extension of this manifest destiny, yes, you have the continental United States formed. You have California now, but what about going further west? And almost immediately at the end of the American Civil War, the United States looks west. And we'll start with American expansion in the Pacific by talking about how America acquires Alaska. And then we'll move on to Hawaii from there. America's Secretary of State during the Lincoln years in the Civil War era was William Henry Seward. And in 1867, he negotiates a deal with the Russians to purchase Alaska for a whopping $7.2 million. Chump change today. But in the day, it was viewed as a ridiculous waste of government money. What the hell do you want in Alaska? There's nothing but ice cubes up there. And they referred to this as Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox. Looking back today, Americans can say, thank God this guy did what he did. Because I'm reasonably certain there's more than $7.2 million in resources in Alaska. Hell, you probably can't buy a home in Ketchikan for $7.2 million today. Pretty crazy. Yet from a geopolitical standpoint, Seward and those that did go along with this and approved the appropriations for this, they had more in mind here. Think about the timing here. This is 18 and 67. This is the same time the Canadian Act is passed. Canadians are given dominion by the English. Coincidence? Perhaps. Or perhaps the British recognize something else that's going on here. If you look at the real small map at the center of this slide, you can see how disjointed Alaska is from the rest of the United States. By the way, pretty damn big swath of land too, right? Yet because Alaska is not contiguous with the rest of the United States, why would not the United States want to make it so? Which means all those western lands, today we could call that British Columbia, largely. Why would not the United States want to have that? And don't think for a minute the British didn't recognize this. They did. In fact, the British tried to buy Alaska from Russia first. Because the Russians didn't like the British, they said, screw you, pound salt, we're going to sell it to the United States. How do you like them freaking apples? So perhaps part of the calculus for the English to provide Canadian dominion was as a way to limit American possessions in North America. After all, they've repeatedly tried to take Canada in the past. So by providing Canadian dominion, you allow these western lands to join Canada, therefore depriving the United States of more land and resources. The British perspective aside, what Seward was able to do as well by purchasing Alaska from Russia was basically get Russians out of North America and off the North American continent. A little sidebar for those that might do some traveling in Alaska. And by the way, you have to go. It's an unbelievably amazing place. Up in Haines, there's a Fort Seward. No coincidence, named after William Henry Seward. While not a big town, something to check out, especially if you're en route to Skagway or in that region. With Alaska firmly in hand, and if you take a look at this slide and the map in the upper left-hand corner, you can see Alaska shaded at the top. If you go due south from that, about the center of that graphic, there's a set of islands. It's called Hawaii. For Americans, the Kingdom of Hawaii had long been on the radar. This is a place where they had sought to expand sugar plantations and the sugar trade. Clearly, pineapples were a prized commodity. And what most people may not know, whaling was a huge deal. In fact, some nearly 800 whaling vessels would put into ports in the Hawaiian Islands when the U.S. whaling industry reached its peak about 1845-1846, so right about the time of the Mexican-American 
War. And in fact, during the American Civil War, the famed CSS Shenandoah, when it set about the world to go ahead and try to destroy U.S. shipping, had spent some time in Hawaiian waters sinking U.S. whaling vessels. But what really made the whaling industry disappear in Hawaii, and perhaps of some note to folks from Pennsylvania, was the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in 1859-1860. Thus, after the American Civil War, once the United States purchases Alaska, they're really looking at Hawaii for naval operations to establish one of those coaling stations we talked about, but to also expedite the production of sugar. And it's really the story of sugar that's going to lead to the demise of the kingdom of Hawaii. Very complex situation to be sure, which also included American sugar business interests in Cuba as well. For those interested in how the United States eventually comes about annexing Hawaii, I'd ask that you Google it. Just understand that it really is sugar that's going to lead to the U.S. eventually annexing Hawaii. Although as a 1A or major sub point to that. It's Pearl Harbor and the naval base there and its strategic location and value that's also going to lead to U.S. wanting to annex Hawaii outright as well. And therefore by 1898 the United States pursuing this manifest destiny all the way halfway across the Pacific now has Alaska to the north and Hawaii to the south question is do you continue to go further west? The answer to that will be why not? While perhaps difficult to read on this slide, the arrow that extends to the west from the Hawaiian Islands has its point at the Philippine Islands. So how in the blue blazes does the United States get the Philippines? It's a Spanish possession after all. Well, there's this thing called a Spanish-American War. We'll go there next. Look, as it relates to the Spanish-American War and American interests in the Caribbean, especially Cuba, this is a 16-week project. I mean, hell, we can go back before the American Civil War and there was talk about trying to annex Cuba and make it a slave state to help counterbalance the free states that were entering the Union in the North as a way to try to save the Union. So Americans had an interest in Cuba long before American business interests in sugar and mining take place in the area. And therefore, for those that are interested, I really would ask that you take some time to research it. It's an interesting story to be sure. But for the sake of time and brevity here, I'm just, just going to give some basic background information as to the causes of this war and most importantly what the Americans are going to pick up from the Spanish as a result of a victory in this Spanish-American War. So let's talk briefly about causes and then the result as well. Prior to getting into more of the causes specifically, I wanted to start with some ideology. And the ideology in a way could be considered a cause, rightfully so. But go all the way back to the Monroe Doctrine. The United States didn't want any Europeans in the entire hemisphere to begin with. And once they hear that the Cubans now are beginning to rise up, beginning to embrace Johann Gottfried Herder's sense of nationalism, get rid of the damn Spanish, we'll have our own place here. Couple that with growing American naval power, largely based on Mahanian naval theory, ever-expanding American business interests in Cuba, like mining, like sugar production, and America's recognition that Spain as a power is waning. Heck, you can all, go all the way back to 1854 when the United States was plotting to get Cuba from Spain during the Franklin Pierce administration. Yes, the same Franklin Pierce administration that sent their navy to where? Tokyo. Hello, baby. Yes, this thing called an Osten, O-S-T-E-N-D, manifesto. The Osten Manifesto, where the United States did plot to grab Cuba. So you couple all these together to include American recognition that the Spanish own the Philippines, and it seems like this is a nice little recipe for war if somehow you can find yourself at war with Spain. And the United States will find itself at war with Spain because of two key events, which we'll talk about next. The two events, both linked and both considered causes in their own right, are listed here on this slide. While many of you may be familiar with the USS Maine, remember the Maine, the explosion in Havana Harbor, and the tragedy that was that event that claimed some 260 Americans' lives, you might not know anything about this DeLome letter that went with it. 
The Delome letter, written by the gentleman in the upper left-hand corner, the Spanish ambassador of the United States depicted here, his name is Don Enrique Dupois Delome. It was written against this backdrop of peace negotiations that were being held by President McKinley at the time. McKinley had called the Spanish ambassador in and Cuban rebel leaders or representatives of the rebel leaders to see if they could work out some sort of arrangement. And within the letter, by the way, it would be sent to Madrid, the capital of Spain, via Cuba. So when it arrived in Cuba, the telegram, Cuban rebels intercepted this, turned around and sent it back to the representatives in Washington, D.C., who somehow magically leaked it to William Randolph Hearst, who was the editor, very well-known publisher at the time, editor of the New York World, and somehow magically the entire letter got published so that the American people could read what the Spanish ambassador wrote. And while you're free to go ahead and Google the letter, it's out there, you can read it, the Cliff Notes version is this. DeLome basically called McKinley an idiot. It was a pretty disparaging letter to the President of the United States and perhaps by extension the Oval Office itself and perhaps by extension Americans writ large. And thus, once Americans began to read this, they started to say, you know what, who the F are these Spanish? Screw these Spanish. You can see where this is going, right? So it starts to turn public sentiment against the Spanish and in favor of American interventionism in support of Cuba in their nationalist effort. So the DeLome letter had a huge impact on America's collective psyche and saying, yeah, maybe this is a fight we should get ourselves involved in. If you've ever heard the expression, weld them together while they're hot, well, that's going to be the case here as well as it relates to the USS Maine. Literally within a week of this DeLome letter being published by Hearst in the New York world, they have another larger story. The USS Maine has exploded and 260 American lives are lost in freaking Havana Harbor. You guys can almost imagine the wild speculation as to how this occurred, right? Must have been the damn Spanish. They already released this letter. Look at them. This is an insult. Blah, 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 blah. You can see where this is going. And quite frankly, it went there. And not shortly long after this event, in the wake of the DeLome letter as well, Congress asks for a declaration of war and bada bing, bada boom, Spanish-American war is underway. As perhaps an interesting sidebar relating to the explosion of the main, more modern research and uses of technology, literally within the last dozen years, has ruled out Spanish sabotage, has ruled out Cuban nationalist sabotage, and landed on the fact that it was probably internal combustion. One of the coal bunkers within the ship internally combusted and blew the ever-living piss out of the ship. It just happened. So it really was an accident. But hell, the timing of it couldn't have been worse for the Spanish, really. It couldn't. And the Spanish didn't have any choice. They had to fight. You have the war declared on you, you have to fight. But they're up against an opponent that's much larger, much more technologically advanced. Hell, is part of the Pacific fleet for the Spanish was still wooden ships up against ironclad ships. Good luck with that one, right? Not to mention that the Americans are going to be supporting Cuban nationalists in Cuba. And at the same time, they're supporting Filipino nationalists who are rising up against the Spanish in the Philippines. So take technology out of it altogether, you're at a manpower disadvantage. This is not a fair fight, but hey, all's fair in love and war, as the old adage goes, and to the victor go the spoils. And the United States is going to be very successful in their campaigns in the Pacific, as they will the Caribbean. And as a result of a victory here, they're going to pick up some pretty good possessions, pretty good good spheres of influence and control. Not only will the United States establish a sphere of influence over Cuba and the Caribbean, but they will outright annex the Philippines after waging the successful Filipino-American war. Filipinos, led by Aguinaldo, had thought that they were fighting for their own independence. They didn't quite know that the United States had other designs. And so that once the Spanish were thrown out, then the United States had to subdue that population and annex the Philippines. And in the wake of this, the question, in the, at least in the Pacific, is how is Japan going to take this? Well, they eliminated the Qing and the 
First Sino-Japanese War. They're getting ready to throw down against Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. So I guess that would just leave the United States to deal with, right? And Teddy Roosevelt would know a little something about the Japanese because he helped negotiate the treaty that ended the Russo-Japanese War. And it'll be Teddy Roosevelt, the former Assistant Secretary of Navy, now President of the United States, that's going to send the Great White Fleet on a projection of American power, most especially to Japan and throughout the Pacific. And we'll see how this plays out in weeks ahead. But for now, we're going to end Part 2 and Lecture 8 here. Dr. J.C. out. We head next to World War One.